Thank you, Leia. Um, as soon as she handed me the microphone, I just flashed back to this moment. It wasn't a moment, it was like 45 minutes. Um, I'm gonna sit. I just flashed back to my freshman year cello recital at Duquesne, um, where I played Bach's second unaccompanied cello suite, which is a pretty, it's a pretty substantial piece. And to this day, I don't know what the hell happened, but like three notes in, I just, I played it from memory and I lost it entirely. I just totally, <laughs> I totally winged it for about 45 minutes um, and I made it through. So I guess that's me comforting myself right now. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you um, to the Pittsburgh Glass Center for hosting us and uh, to Christiane for this amazing meal. I was gonna not eat before we started but then I saw that there was Trace Leche's cake um, and I was very excited about that. Um, so Leia covered some things that I do, um, but I am, uh, I work in production at Pittsburgh Modular Synthesizers. So that's my day job. I build, build and test synthesizers, and at night I uh, run the soundboard up your low box, and then in between, and kind of sporadically, I record bands. Um, I, I'm, I don't want to call anyone out right now, but I have to give a shout out to a very special friend who's in the audience right now, Catherine, Catherine Veracoli. Um, she, I really can't overestimate, or, or, or I, can't, I can't explain how important it is to me that you're here today. Um, when I, in 2012, I went to my first audio conference in Tucson, um, the Potluck Audio Convention, and I was pretty new to recording, hadn't spent much time in studios, um, and I was pretty terrified of everything. And I was not only the only woman, but the youngest, and was really afraid to talk. Um, and so I went to a panel discussion, and Catherine was one of the speakers, and it was called Analog Commitment in the Age of Undo. I should give you some info about her. Catherine is um, an engineer, an educator at the Recor Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, and um, has run her own analog studio, 513 Analog, for over 10 years now in Phoenix. Um, and seeing her talk, um, it, it changed my life, because I had never met a woman who did this. So years later, I, why am I crying? <laughs> um, for you to be here now watching me talk is this really beautiful full circle moment. She just happened to be in Pittsburgh this week visiting friends. So I'm so happy you're here today. Um, she's never ever hesitated to encourage me and to offer a hell yeah, you got this, and me saying I don't know what I'm doing and her saying, just do it, just try, just go for it. And that's, that's really invaluable to me. So her presence has always been really affirming for me. Um, and she really represents um, so much of what I care about and what I want to work towards in my field. So I have some notes here just because this is pretty out of my wheelhouse. Um, it's kind of funny to be talking about my career and my experiences. Um, I'm 24 years old. <laughs> so uh, a lot of these reflections that I'm sharing, a lot of these ideas and experiences are pretty recent. Um, and some of the pictures that I will be showing were taken, there's one that was taken like six days ago. Um, so a lot of these things that I'm talking about are happening now, and I'm in, in the thick of figuring it all out. Um, I feel like, if, if anything, I'm at quite a new beginning um, at this point in my life, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I, 
made my first recording when I was uh, 17 years old. It is this cassette, definitely not gonna play it, um, but I carry it with me most places I go um, because it's really important to me. It's me playing cello and singing, um, and uh, I didn't know anything about recording, and I didn't really care, but I knew that I liked the sound of tape hiss, and I knew that with some babysitting money, I could afford a handheld cassette recorder and um, some cassettes. I walked to Target and bought those things and made this recording. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I moved to, uh, oh, and also I just, I just remembered. So I made five of them, but not because I knew what a tape duplicator was or had access to one, because I didn't know that that existed. So I just played the song five different times on five different cassettes and then threw in the towel and considered it a limited edition run. Um, but <laughs> so maybe I'll sell them on the internet for a really high price one day. Um, so I moved to Pittsburgh in 2010 to pursue a music degree at Duquesne. I studied cello with Adam Liu um, of the Pittsburgh Symphony, and he was an incredible teacher. And during my sophomore year, I started reaching out to local studios. We do have some local studios in Pittsburgh. They do exist. Um, fewer and fewer, but I think that's kind of everywhere. That's not just Pittsburgh. Um, so I got an internship at a local studio, and um, it was, it's a huge space. It's really big. It's a building, I'm going to say like 7,000 square feet, with lots of studio spaces within this building. Um, and there was a laundry room and a kitchen and an office and um, a lounge for touring bands to sleep. And that's usually where I slept. Um, and uh, I spent most of my first few months in the labs there. Um, and I remember in my interview there, um, the chief recording engineer asked me if I, had, if I knew how to solder, if I'd ever soldered before. And I remember just like nodding my head up and down and smiling and then thinking, no. <laughs> but I, I just said I did. Um, so I don't really think that, I, I don't wanna, you know, I don't advocate lying <laughs> to get what you want, but I think of myself then as a as a, a 19 year old who was really desperately wanting a chance um, and some kind of foot or like pinky toe in the door, wanting to be taken seriously in this industry that um, historically has and continues to overlook the accomplishments of, of women. Um, so. I spent a few months in the lab building and repairing instrument cables and mic cables and then um, building, oh, I forgot I have some slides here. Um, this, was a, this was a few years ago. This was one of my first sessions that I actually engineered by myself. Um, but I spent um, a long time in the lab and after a couple months I started assisting assisting other engineers' sessions, and then after a couple months after that, um, started taking on sessions of my own. And so it all happened pretty quickly, and I've noticed that um, I guess my MO in life a lot of times um, is to just dive in, just jump in the deep end and, f and learn how to swim, um, which has its pros and cons. It can be a little stressful, but that's what I did. I, um, I just tried to figure it out as I went along and um, had some kind of flame inside of me that just wanted to keep going and, and push through all this weird stuff that I had to deal with. It was really strange being the youngest person and being the only woman there. Um, uh, to be honest, a lot of it was not fun. Um, I dealt with a lot of stuff and um, and, and accepted a lot of stuff that I wouldn't accept now, um, but I didn't really know how to handle it back then. Um, so if you're not familiar with recording studios, a long, t a long time ago, and for the first, a lot of the, the, the records that we all know and love um, were funded by big record labels that, f that funnel a lot of money to bands to spend time in these recording studios, and a lot of 
artists wrote these albums in the studios. Um, and if you've ever seen a movie with a recording studio, I don't know, or any pictures, um, that's kind of what this, this place was like, the big, the large consoles and the beautiful vintage microphones and this really rare boutique um, exquisite gear. Um, but with that came some downsides um, because um, it's expensive. And I should say, I, I don't think that they were overcharging or price gouging at all, but it's really expensive to make a record. Um, and it's expensive to maintain a facility like that. So people were really um, stressed. And, and it was always kind of this battle of um, time and money and that, you know, that resulted in this pressure. And I always noticed that the first thing to go when that happened um, was the emotion about the music. And that was really unfortunate. But sometimes you just had to kind of get through stuff and just keep going. Um, I also, let me see if this is my next picture. So I have, I got into this like obsessive phase. I was like a sponge just trying to absorb everything. And I have, um, 25 moleskin journals that are written this small. I can't even read most of this. I don't know why I, don't know why I wrote so small. Um, but it's a lot of these, and I just wrote down every single thing I recorded, every sound I recorded, every edit I made, um, kind of maniacally. And also, I wrote down, Catherine, I wrote down like pretty much word for word everything you said in that panel in this book just because I was like, it, I, had, I had never heard a woman talk about this. Um, so it was huge for me. Um, I don't even know what's next. Yeah, so it was just, I don't know. I, I guess this is all to say that this was a really strange time for me, um, trying to learn as much as I could, um, but also really kind of faking it till I made it. Um, and I kind of hate that phrase because I don't know what make it actually means. But um, I, I, I read, I was v revisiting these journals uh, recently, and I, I read that on my first session that I recorded all by myself, um, <laughs> I used 28 microphones on a drum kit. If you don't know anything about recording, um, I'll just let you know that that's insane. You do not need 28 microphones on a drum kit. I don't even know if I could find 28 things to, to mic on a drum kit now, but there were four mics on the kick drum. So that's just, it was, I was that obsessive. Um, but yeah, so that was a pretty strange time and I continued like that for a couple years and I went to, I was in college, so I went to school during the day, worked a restaurant job in the evening and then um, at night went to the studio and barely slept and had eight to 10 cups of coffee a day and um, I, I don't know how I did that and I, I don't think anyone should do that. Um, but that was, that was life for a while. And um, as time went on, it, it felt progressively more empty because I never really, I realized I never felt comfortable there. Um, and it felt like there really wasn't a space for me, um, which was increasingly more frustrating. And um, people I was becoming friends with and, and musicians that I cared about couldn't afford to, to work there. So just by being there, I was pricing people out of the chance to work with me, which was kind of funny considering I was so new to this and still learning so much. Um, but so I was really, really searching um, for space within this industry um, that I felt like didn't exist, or I at least didn't know about. Um, and people often made comments, and I, I really think that people had good intentions, but people often made comments like, wow, that's, that's awesome, like you're a woman in the studio. I've never seen a woman in a place like this before, and I don't really know how to respond to that. Like, yeah, I, I'm a woman, you know? Um, it's, but it just kept happening, um, and I felt really tokenized, and um, like a, just there was, like I said earlier, there was just a lot of stuff that I had to put up with um, that I didn't want to. Um, any display of emotion, the the hysterical woman card was pulled all the time, and I hate that. Um, because, like I've already cried once in the last 10 minutes. I, crying is awesome and I do it all the time and I don't want to be in a place where I'm afraid to cry. So, so I was searching for all this space and I, I realized um, there are 
people would ask me like, why are there so few women in audio? Why are there so few women in the studio and like, you know, making records? And, and I realized like, that's just not true. So I reached out over Instagram to Catherine um, and I started collecting interviews and stories of women in my field. She was the first person I thought of because she was the first woman I ever knew that did this. Um, and she was incredibly open and we talked. Um, we sent a lot of emails about her experiences. Um, and I realized that people, like so many of these women exist and they're just ignored. And it's not, they're not new, they've been here. They've made really beautiful records. Um, and their stories are just so often ignored. So I started this zine, and if, if you aren't familiar with a zine, it's basically like a DIY magazine. Um, I really love DIY, but I also know that's because I have to, um, because it's, it's what's accessible to me. So this is the first issue of Women in Sound. Um, and then there's two more that exist now, and I'm making the fourth one, but it's basically a collection of interviews and essays and how-tos, um, not only just of stories of women in my field, but um, of um, so a lot of audio literature is is really inaccessible, even to to people like me who work in this field. And I still am like trying to pull back layers and figure out what a lot of these words mean. There's all this like flowery language and and really specific talk about about gear and stuff that I, it, you know it just doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't even really it doesn't even really make sense to me. So. Um, that was another big frustration of mine that a lot of the audio industry was so inaccessible to anybody who would want to, to take the first step and learn more. So that's a big commitment of mine in this publication is that everything I do, I want it to be accessible to someone who has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so if I'm interviewing, um, my friend Heba is a really amazing mastering engineer in New York and in her interview, um, in the first issue, we talked about mastering and then I realized I had to back up and say like, what is mastering? because I want, I want someone who does, has no idea what you do to be able to read this and learn from it and gain from it. Um, so Women in Sound, um, it's an ongoing thing for me um, and something that I am kind of just continuously trying to figure out as I go along. Um, and I feel like with each issue, it becomes a little bit more of what I want it to be. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So in, in back to searching for space and wanting to find space, um, I applied on a whim for a studio residency in France. This is the studio, it's beautiful. Um, and it was, um, it was a, a week in La Fabrique Studios in southern France, um, and the engineer in residence was Steve Albini, who is one of my favorite engineers ever, and he's made a lot of records that um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. I, I heard about him for the first time because he recorded In Utero by Nirvana, um, and so I think at, at, at that time, I just thought that made him like the coolest person that existed. Um, so I applied on a whim and was accepted, um, and I, <laughs> I called my parents and was like, S uh, I need to borrow a little bit of money because I got to buy a plane ticket to France. Um, and they, luckily, they just went with it. Um, so anyways, I'm, this was a huge, huge turning point for me. Um, I was sitting at this console one day. It's a Neve 88R. It's definitely the most beautiful console I've ever seen. Um, I was sitting at this console and I was playing some of my work for Steve Albini, who's one of my truly one of my heroes. Um, and I was just sitting there so anxiously, feeling like I think there might be a picture of us. Oh, his head is cut off, but this is us in front of that console. When I was in this phase of like never smiling in photos, I wish I would have just smiled and not tried to act so hard. But um, but we're sitting in front of this console and I am so nervous. I feel like I'm gonna barf. He's just sitting there like listening to my work just silently. Just and I'm like, I'm having, about to have a heart attack, wondering what he's gonna say. And afterwards, he like pushes the faders down and 
and says, it's good. What, it's, what, 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 it's good? I, what else? I don't know. It was, I, I was, didn't you, I was so frazzled in that moment. Like, it's good? What are you talking about? It's good. I don't even know what I'm doing. And he said, could I give you a piece of advice? I said, yes, please. And he said, I think you need to calm down <laughs> just in life. I think you just need to chill. You're 23. This was February of last year. You just need to calm down. Like, you're going to have a heart attack by the time you're 30. You're going to never want to make another record if you continue this way. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll cal I'm calm. I'll calm down. I'm cool. Um, but that was really important to me. Um, that time with him, that brief time with him, um, really changed my life and changed a lot of what I think about recording. Um, he was incredibly incredibly open um, with all of his ideas and resources um, and uh, has never hesitated to, to respond to my frantic emails even now. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. What, should, what am I doing? What should I do? Um, but calming down was a, big, was a big step for me. And it's definitely still a work in progress. Um, but, but that was a good step to take. Um, so... Um, there's us. <laughs> um, after coming back from France, I realized that the that the studio life was less and less, um, less and less of where I needed to be. I wanted to still make records, but I just felt like as time went on, um, it wasn't it wasn't working out, and I still wasn't finding a space. Um, so I started to take things a little bit more into my own hands, and I held my first sound recording workshop. Um, again, I really want. I really want everything I do to be accessible to people, not just with money and not just with a pre-existing skill set. Um, so that's one thing I really love to do. Um, uh, that bottom picture is me recording the sounds of a, s a sidewalk. Um, why not? Um, but, oh, and there's women in sound again. Um, but I left the studio finally in January of this year. And this whole past year, 2016, has been, um, really strange, and I've been an engineer without a studio. And what does that look like? Um, it looks up like loading your 27-year-old car with all of the small amount of gear that you have and just driving to wherever the bands are to record them. So I learned how to be resourceful this year um, and just kept going. And, and uh, oh, I wrote down a note. I remember when the, the day that I left the studio, um, I was really heartbroken, and I felt like um, it was such a big part of my identity that was now taken away. Um, and so I went to see a friend's band play at Gooski's and ran into another friend, John, John Viegas, who owns the record store in Polish Hill, uh, where I live. And um, I was pretty distraught, and I said, I, I left the studio. I, I don't know how I'm going to keep going. I don't know how I'm going to ever make another record. And his first response was, oh, cool. Um, well, now we could like talk about you recording my band. Would you want to do that? And it was so strange. And it, it was like I finally became accessible to, by leaving one, one place. I, a lot of other doors opened up. And so this last year has, has been me um, kind of stepping back and, and going a lot more DIY um, and becoming a lot more accessible to people I care about, um, which is exciting. I do, I do miss having everything set up for me in the studio. Um, I, can't, I can't underestimate how, how nice that was. But um, I feel like this year I focused more on the artistry than the gear. Um, some, and I think this is not limited to sound, but in a lot of creative areas, sometimes we get so focused on the gear and the tools that we're using um, that we kind of lose sight of what we're using them for and what we're doing. Um, and I realized that I had become really obsessed with gear. Um, and, and I do think that a lot of gear is really amazing and, and beautiful and, and worthy of extensive analysis and critique, but um, the gear is not above me, the engineer, the person using it. Um, let's see. Oh, that's, that's, have you ever seen a picture of yourself and you're like, damn, that is so realistic. 
That is like such an accurate depiction. So, so going to a lot of spaces this year, this, I, someone took this picture of me and I was like, that, <laughs> that's pretty much this year summed up. This was in the basement of an old schoolhouse in Munn Hall. Um, I've been working on a record with a band called Choir that I really love and it is a giant open space. Um, I <laughs> um, actually used this microphone. The space is so reverberant and not ideal for recording in a lot of ways, but um, I actually spent a couple hours with this contact microphone. This is a hydrophone, so it can be boiled and frozen. But I spent um, a couple hours with this microphone inside of my mouth, being careful not to move my tongue around because it was, um, we were, I was trying to find a way to have a room mic that like wasn't totally echoey, that was more of like a mid-rangey, um, kind of garagey sound. And I put it in my mouth, and it worked. Um, so that leads me to where I am now. Um, I, this past weekend, I started the build out on my own very small studio. Uh, it's called Accessible Recording. Um, and that name, I never considered any other name. I was visiting some friends in Philly, and I was hanging out with another engineer, Jeff Ziegler, who has a really beautiful studio and has made some amazing records. And I was hanging out at his house, just journaling, like, what do I want my space to be like? If I had a space, what would I want it to be like? And the first word that just flew out of my hand was accessible. Um, so that's the only name I've ever considered. Um, and what does that mean? I want financial accessibility. Um, so for me, that means having a small space, um, a space where my costs to keep it running are low. Um, I want to have, find a balance of, of being affordable but also feeding myself. Um, geographic accessibility is of importance to me. Um, I don't want you to have to have a car to get to me, which was the case at the studio where I worked. It was a little bit outside the city. Um, and one day I had to take three buses and walk a mile to get there when my car broke down. Um, I want it to be accessible to parents. And um, for that, I want free childcare. I really, I firmly believe that not people without children, myself included, need to step it up for parents. Um, I can't say that I'm here for women without being here for parents too. Um, so that's really important to me, to have free childcare available. And I also want it to be a place that's accessible to all levels of knowledge. Um, I don't ever want someone to be as terrified to ask questions as I was. Uh, it's something that I'm still working on. It's a really uh, deeply packed anxiety that um, I've been trying to, trying to let go of. And that's a slow, that's a slow process, but um, I'm getting there, and by my hope is that by helping other people do that and um, establishing a foundation that's comfortable for them to ask questions, um, that we can we can figure that out together. Um, this is <laughs> I have one picture of me in this space, and it's an Instagram selfie. Um, this past weekend, uh, a friend of mine, Sam Pace, helped me build build 24 um, two by four frames that will be um, sound dampening wall panels. Um, and in this moment, I, this was six days ago, I sat in this room um, and cried a little bit just because I felt so supported and happy and encouraged and, and finally I feel like, I, you know, there's so, so many questions that I don't, do not have answers to. Um, I really, like I said at the beginning, I am out of, I'm about to enter this door that I've, ne this threshold of a door that I've never crossed before. Um, but in this moment, I felt so happy and so content and felt like um, I was finally starting to do what I wanted to do. So to sum this all up, what did I learn in my first five years of recording? Um, that gear is intelligent, but it's not emotional. Um, and only I can bring the human element of this into sound. Um, so not to let the gear uh, not to obsess over the gear. I went from working in a space where I had any piece of gear that I could think of um, to loading up a few microphones and my laptop into the back of my Subaru. So, but, but both of those experiences were really beautiful and meaningful and I made recordings I really care about. Um, when you can't find space, uh, do what you can to make it. Um, I can't change other people, I can't change um, 
a lot of parts of audio culture that I don't like, but I can, you know, try to punch some walls down. And sometimes it feels like clawing your way through, but I can try to make some more space um, because I'm not the only one who wants it. And finally, ask all of your questions. So that's it on my end. <laughs>